Hello, and welcome to the Thyroid Warrior Podcast. I'm Ebony, and I'm here as your wellness facilitator. I'm going to be sharing my experiences in managing Hashimoto's disease, and I really hope that it'll help you on your personal journey. Keep in mind, however, this does not substitute as medical advice. It is only for your information and motivational purposes only. Now, let's get started. Hello, friends. I'm very excited to continue this conversation. And what's really important is that last week laid the foundation of giving you a basic overview of what's called social determinants of health. So I know that that may have come across as being really abstract and you're like, okay, girl, that was that was great. But none of that really means anything to me or anyone that's close to me. So why'd you bring that up? And I'm glad you asked. So to start, one thing that's really important is I always love to give real life examples. And I gave a lecture actually at the university that I teach at about social determinants of health and I presented it in a way that gave a real life example and so many of the public health students were like wait wait this is what that looks like and I'm like yes you have to be so very careful about labeling people or judging them or from your perspective you're looking at it from this patient never shows up for appointments But there could be a complete and totally acceptable reason as to why they're having issues getting to their appointments. So let's take that example, that very example. I have a friend who has a lot of health conditions and they also live in the city And it's not exactly what I would call safe for them to walk out of their neighborhood or when it comes to taking public transportation, it's, it's, it's real sketchy. It, the, the buses don't run regularly to their neighborhood and they often miss appointments and they can't afford to get an Uber to the doctor's office. They don't have anyone that they could ask to take them to the doctor. And if the bus doesn't run efficiently or timely, they end up missing their appointments. Add to that, I don't have enough money to really and truly afford most of my medication. So I have to then decide Am I going to pay for my medication or am I going to pay my light bill? Or I don't necessarily have the best health insurance or health insurance at all, but I need my medication. But I also don't know to ask my doctor what other alternatives do I have? Do I have the option to apply for basically for the drug company to offer assistance to help me pay for my medication. And I also don't know that I can contact my local CVS to see what medications are on the low or no cost list that I can give my doctor to ask, hey, I can't afford this $300 medication that you're giving me. Can you pick from this list? This one, this one right here. I don't know that. And this is something that my friend has often struggled with. And I turned it to I a second ago because those are the types of conversations that we have had. So it's not a black and white thing from the doctor's office perspective to say, oh, this patient never shows up. They never pay their co-pays. They're always late. It's always going in in collections. And it's not fair because... That person does not have the economic resources, support, or anything else 
to really and truly be able to get to their appointments on time, make sure they make their appointments. And I had someone ask me, well, why can't they just schedule a virtual visit? It's been COVID. Why can't they do that? They don't have internet and they can't afford it. So again, unless they have access to some type of subsidy to get internet access, they can't have a video visit. Well, why can't they use their phone? Because they have a government issued phone. And many of those phones don't support having unlimited data or even the ability to get free text messages. Now, I know they've come a long way, but this is, it's not even giving you an, an extreme example because in all honesty, there are a lot of people that live this way on a day-to-day basis. Many people in my family struggle with this all the time. And then when you have someone where English isn't their first language, and that's why I talked about limited English proficiency, then you have to add on the fact that our, is the hospital or clinical staff even communicating with the patient in a way that they even understand? And yes, that was a very purposeful pause because I want you to start thinking about a lot of these things, regardless of whether or not it's for you or a loved one. But just having that example is really meant to help you see, oh, it's not that easy. Or even put yourself in that position, whether it was currently You may be in a position where you can afford your medication, where you have transportation that's reliable, that can get you back and forth to the doctor, or you can afford to to purchase good, healthy food all the time. That may be the case for you, but there are a lot of people, regardless of race or ethnicity, that struggle with this on a day-to-day basis. And in many cases, I did a few uh, studies and read a few articles about how the playing field is basically level between blacks and whites in Baltimore, for example. And there are a lot of places that I have gone in Baltimore where I'm like, you know what? I shouldn't be here. I need to go. I need to go. And it was a very diverse area, but it was also very poor. And it's, it's, it's something that keeps me so incredibly humble because I've been there and I know what that feels like. I know what it's like to be on food stamps, what it's like to be on Medicaid, what it's like to struggle to try to catch the bus that you missed, that you knew that was the only bus that you were going to be able to get in order to get to your appointment or even school on time. It's not something that I talk about publicly, quote unquote, and maybe that's something that one day I will have more of an in-depth conversation about, but it's really important that we seek to limit judgment because many, many people often assume, oh, if I say, or tell them, yeah, I'm from Detroit. They're like, ha, what's the burp? Not a city, east side of Detroit. Um, yeah, um, I got nothing. I, I, I can't, uh, I'm, I'm not good at lying. So to try to figure out a suburb isn't going to happen. I mean, obviously I know the suburbs of Detroit, but it was a struggle. I know what that's like to get the government cheese that never melts, but that peanut butter was something special. (laughs) And it is also something very special that bonds you to people that are in the same predicament that you are in. And what I mean by that is growing up, we never necessarily looked at it like, 
I'm poor or I can't afford this or I can't do that. Everyone was basically in the same boat. So you shared resources, all the jokes about, you know, oh, can I get a cup of sugar? And any type of sharing of said resources that you may have come across with folks joking about it, that very much so was real life day to day. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not embarrassed by it. But it helps me to understand when I hear the doctor, I mean, I'm in a lay health educator program and I'm watching them talk about dietary things and nutritional needs and, oh, don't drink juice. Oh, just eat some whole wheat toast. Bro, I, I, my, my mother could not afford whole wheat toast. And to be real frank, if it wasn't Wonder Bread, we weren't bringing it into the house. Mostly because my, my mother, as she did a phenomenal job, but when you're trying to raise children on your own with a very limited income, you ain't think about no whole wheat bread and no whole wheat toast and nothing like that, okay? I asked my mother if I could try carrots and different vegetables and all of those things. And she was very happy to oblige. They were out of a can, but they were still good enough for me. And I came out all right. And that is why I often share and tell you things don't have to be organic in order for you to eat better or start to live a healthy life. Because a lot of us don't come from a place of being able to afford a lot of these things. A lot of us don't really know the differences between all of these things. And sometimes all you can afford are canned fruits and vegetables. There is no shame in that. We all have our baseline of what we can afford and what we have access to. And that is why for me, I often tell my clients, I tell my family, you start from where you are. And when healthcare providers understand where their patients are coming from and what they can and can't do and what they have access to, it can then change the conversation about how to best care for me as a patient and how I can communicate to you as a healthcare professional. End of story. And I always love it when my healthcare team has served in diverse communities because they get it. While that may not necessarily be their experience, they get it. And it makes for a much easier conversation. And that is often why anytime I'm at work or anytime I'm having conversations with healthcare professionals, I often interject and share, I love that you're thinking about that, but not everyone can afford that or not everyone has access to that. And how do we make things more accessible? And that's not just from an economic or can I affordability perspective, but it's also understanding for those of us that have physical, emotional, mental disabilities or differences, how do you make sure that they have access to things? How do you make sure that they can get to you appropriately? How do we ensure that we are giving everyone access to be able to receive quality care? And that's a very difficult question to answer. It seems very simple when you, when you just think about it. But there's a lot that goes into that. And you have to look at it by the demographic, whether it's rural or urban, whether you're in, a, in a, the climate that you're in, what access do people have, natural disasters, all of those things have to go into consideration. So I want to stop there, but I wanted to be able to give you an example and share with you a little bit more about 
why this is such a personal topic to me and why I'm actually just happy to to have the conversation. And this is why I said previously, it's not just about race. It's not just about a male or a female thing. It's about all of us. And I appreciate the fact that we're talking more about minority communities that are in this predicament and how we're struggling with it. But I also want to recognize that there are a lot of us that have the same issues and struggles. And when we can actually look at, hey, wait a minute, you did say that. I struggle with that too. And it may not be something that you struggle with currently. It may have been something that you went through or a family member may be going through it. But if we start to understand that although we're different and although our circumstances may be different, the end game is still the same. And that is we all deserve to get access to care we need to understand where we're all starting from and we need to work together to figure out how we can advocate for ourselves and each other and no I'm not living in a utopian world where I think oh we're all going to get along I get it there we're people where we have problems issues and it's just a lot sometimes but for me a part of helping you advocate for yourself and for each other is recognizing that we all have a struggle in some way, shape, form, or fashion, and how do we help each other get to where we need to get. So with that, friends, be happy, be whole, and be well. Take care. Okay, Thyroid Warriors, get out there and take things one step at a time. Remember, reflect on your triumphs, know that you are doing your best, and do what you need to do in order to be well. I would absolutely love it if you subscribe to this podcast and share this episode with a friend. And don't forget, leave me a review. I read those and try very hard to improve the show based upon your feedback. So I'd love to hear from you. And with that, be happy, be whole, and be well. Take care.